again of the week. The Dow is down nearly three quarters of one percent. Broader markets also been having some difficulties, but trading is now over. Serious people from Rollins celebrating 50 years on the exchange. Trading is over. It's Friday. It's August the 10th. Donald Trump throws fuel on Turkey's financial fire as the US president raises tariffs where it hurts. Pain during peak travel season. A Ryanair strike is now stranding passengers and harnessing the power of the humble penny. I speak to the chief executive who hopes to convince millennials to tuck away their spare change. I'm Richard Quest, live in the world's financial capital, New York City. Glorious day here in New York, where, of course, I mean business. Tonight, President Trump wades into Turkey's political and economic crisis with new tariffs that are going to make a bad situation worse. It was an announcement via tweet, of course, where the president said, I have just authorized a doubling of tariffs on steel and aluminium with respect to Turkey. Our relations with Turkey are not good at this time. The Turkish president uh, said that this amounts to a declaration of economic war. Christmas. Dollars and stuff will not stop us from building roads. Do not worry. But I am saying it again. If you have dollars, euros, or gold under your pillow, exchange it for Turkish lira in our bags. This is a national struggle. This would be the answer by our people against those who wage economic war on us. The United States is Turkey's top destination for steel exports. The new tariffs pushed the Turkish lira to a record low against the dollar, and fears of contagion spread to European and American markets. We'll deal with that aspect in just a moment. First, though, to understand what this effect is, Senior Engineer John Defterius is in London. John, let's take this at a fair clip. Um, first thing, the, the, the relationship was already bad. Do we know why the US uh, president decided today this random Friday in August to make this action. Well, Richard, one could accuse the U.S. president of kicking both uh, President Erdogan and the lira when they're down. I mean, it was quite abusive. It was an awful day and an awful week for the lira. Just to remind our viewers, we started with a record sell-off at the beginning of the week, and we finished the same way, uh, a low of 17 percent at one point. Uh, to your question here, it does deal with an American pastor, Andrew uh, Brunson. They thought they had an agreement to settle this dispute between them. Uh, there's also the case of a, a Turkish bank supporting uh, Iran during his sanctions that upset uh, President Trump and the State Department. And finally, but there's that lingering issue of Fethullah Gulen, uh, the cleric that pr uh, President Erdogan has wanted to have extradited. But this issue, Richard, has been festering in but Turkey long before President Trump got involved. We can take a look at the correction since the start of the year. It's a 40 percent drop for the currency because inflation's up to nearly 16 percent. Right, the 10-year bond's up at 20 percent, Richard, uh, and they have a rising current account deficit. He has not dealt with it, and President Trump came in at the last minute because they have not seen any John. headway. They thought they had a deal uh, this week, and they had delegation go to Washington, and it fell apart. Why? But how much worse a situation does this make the economic crisis or the financial crisis i mean obviously turkey is a major exporter i think there's six or seven into the united states in terms of steel the uh, one imagines that turkish steel will now become prohibitively expensive what effect is that la is that going to have on the turkish economy well uh, richard this is a, a, an alarm bell that's been ringing as i was saying for a long long time uh, there is a big question here uh, about the concentration of power for President Erdogan. Now, his son-in-law, who's now been handed both the Treasury and Finance Ministries, uh, held a press conference today and announced a midterm solution to bring down growth, to try to bring down inflation. It rang hollow in the financial markets. This is the reality. President Erdogan was at the Black Sea, made this unusual nationalist appeal, telling uh, the Turks to sell gold and sell dollars, as you suggested there in the soundbite to try to boost the lira. Then he went back to the same thing, banging the drum 
about the interest rate lobby. New York, London, Hong Kong, Tokyo, all working against the Turkish lira. Uh, he has concentrated power, and the markets, investors, don't believe that he'll take the right policy to stabilize inflation, right. bring down growth, to get a rally in the lira. John Deftari is in London tonight. Fear of contagion has been spooking investors who are already facing a crisis of confidence. If we take a look at those areas, for example, those uh, banks that have Turkish exposure. You've got the bank shares, the BBVA, they were down 5%. Unit credit down 4.7%. BNP Paribas is down some 3% as investors are worried that Turkey can't pay debts. Uh, and this ECB concern about bank exposure with show those shares very sharply lower. And look at the markets overall in Europe. You've got Zetradax down 2%, uh, Paris down similarly. Uh, the FTSE down 1%. So clearly it's having an effect. William Jackson is the chief emerging markets economist at Capital Economics. Uh, joins me now. Good to see you, sir. Thank you. We're going to be talking to you, uh, Thank uh, you. Uh, on this and, and other things. So the question to John Defterius was, how serious will these extra tariffs on Tur to Turkey, what sort of effect, how much worse will they make the situation? Well, I think the sanctions we saw imposed earlier, late last week, really exacerbated the sell-off in the lira that's happened over the past week. And I think what investors are now thinking about is what happens next? What are the next moves? We saw uh, President Trump raise the tariffs on Turkey's steel and aluminium exports. That will hurt uh, Turkey's export sector, but it also sends a signal that things are getting worse, right. not better. Now, within that, we heard President Erdogan just a, a second or two ago in that uh, soundbite. Is, the, is President Erdogan now falling victim to that mentality that absolute leaders sometimes do, which is, if I say economics is X, then economics is X, even though it might be something completely the opposite. Is he now fooling himself about his own economics? It's a, good, it's a good question. I think one many investors would like to really know. We've seen some rather strange economic theory come from his mouth over the past few years. The idea that higher interest rates actually cause high inflation. This kind of uh, discussion really raises concerns about for investors because it makes them fear that the central bank won't be able to act to actually tackle these high rates of inflation and to shore up the currency. And judging by the speeches earlier, it didn't really see, it didn't seem that he was trying to calm the situation. It merely added fuel to the to the sell-off in the currency. So, if the currency, let's go back to economics 101, if we may, sir. If the mm. currency continues to fall, that obviously creates a balance of payments crisis for Turkey, one where they have to fund the external debt, and that mm. really can only be done either by investors pouring in money or the IMF, or similarly, coming along with a, re with a rescue and a bailout plan. But Capital Economics, how's your view on that? Are we on far, how far off are we from having to have a rescue plan here? Well, I think most countries that have been in Turkey's situation and at least have managed to get out of it have had an IMF plan. Those that haven't, uh, ones that come to mind, of well, Venezuela is one extreme, um, and things have really become very serious there. The few countries have had large currency falls like Brazil and Russia a few years ago and managed to get through it without the IMF. But they did have new go have governments that tightened fiscal policy, that tried to push through reforms, and that had very orthodox central banks. None of this we're seeing in Turkey. Stay with us, uh, stay with us. We have more that we need to talk about uh, with you uh, today. Turkey is not the only country talking of economic war. Russia's prime minister says new sanctions from the United States could be like economic warfare. The ruble's fallen to its lowest point in more than two years. Remember, that's the ruble versus the U.S. dollar. So, of course, the, you see the number going in the opposite direction. It's been falling steadily over fears of new U.S. sanctions, which became a reality on Wednesday. Russian stocks are also suffering. The RTS was down almost 4% uh, in, in Moscow which when you see everybody else's, you see put it into a really grim day. Fred Plykin is in Moscow for us tonight. I am now well and truly confused, Fred Plykin, over exactly how many mm. sanctions, which sanctions, the sanctions over Crimea, the yeah. sanctions over, um, uh, you know, whatever, the sanctions now over the Skripples. 
How many sanctions are there? Oh, there's, there's an unbelievable amount of sanctions. A lot of them, uh, Richard, target uh, Russian individuals. Some of them target Russian companies. Very few target whole Russian sectors. And I think that's one of the things that Dmitry Medvedev, the Russian prime minister, was talking about today when he was speaking in Kamchatka, way in the uh, east, the far east of Russia, where he was saying if there are... Uh, and that's qualifying the statement uh, that you were just reading. If there are uh, sanctions against Russia's banking sector, against the full banking sector, there's already sanctions against some banks, uh, some of them over uh, American uh, election meddling, for instance. But if there are restrictions on financial transactions, then that is something that they would see as economic warfare. And they said that the Russians would retaliate. They said in financial terms uh, and in other terms as well. Also, you have Vladimir Putin, who called in his National Security Council today to speak about all of this, and Sergei. Sergey Lavrov, who directly complained to the American Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, about these measures as well and called them completely unacceptable. So right. you do feel uh, that the Russians are feeling the heat about this because it's something that is a systemic sanctions rather than the individual sanctions that we've seen uh, over the past two years, especially, Richard. And uh, Fred, you, you can bridge the, the, the divide between Washington and Moscow very elegantly. So, so explain to me, for an administration... <laughs> well, an administration that is accused in Washington of, or a president, of being a lover of Russia in the pocket of Vladimir Putin, a, 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 a puppet of, of Russia. I mean, he's taking some of the strictest and harshest sanctions ever against the country. How do you square those two accusations? Yes. Well, that's, that's what the Trump administration says, and, and I, I mean, I wish I could bridge the gap between many countries, but I think it, right now it is, it is very difficult. I mean, one of the things that you have is you do have President Trump who's talking about better relations, but at the same time, you're, actually, uh, you're absolutely right. The Trump administration has put in place some very tough sanctions. Now, there are people in Russia who feel uh, that that tough line against Russia is not coming from the president himself, right. but is actually coming from American institutions, American agencies, like, for instance, the State Department, but also, first and foremost, a Congress, for instance, as well, the Senate and the House of Representatives, forcing the president's hand in many ways. And if you look at, for instance, Russian media, you look at also some of the statements, quite frankly, that President Putin has given as well. They believe that it's President Trump who wants better relations, but that his hands are tied Understood. because of the, the, well, they think it's ill will. But um, uh, so they think that President Trump still wants those better relations. But I think the big question is registered right now. How long is that going to continue? How long are the Russians going to continue to say, look, I think President Trump is going to come through with this. We think he wants better relations, uh, but his, he's hamstrung at the moment. It's a very interesting debate that's actually going on in Russia right now is, is to what extent do they still believe that President Trump is actually going to be able to follow through on some of the things, for instance, that he said in Helsinki, some of the, not promises that he's made, but some of the goals that right. he seemed to be laying out as far as the improvement of Russian-U.S. relations are concerned when you see the reality. Fred Plankin, thank you. B bringing both sides, Washington and Moscow. Back to William Jackson. How damaging uh, to, the, so, to, the, sorry, to the Russian economy is, are these sanctions, these current sanctions, and how much more pain can that economy take? Well, I think the sanctions that were really painful were the ones that came in in 2014 when after Russia's annexation of Crimea and then due, due to the involvement in the conflict in the east of Ukraine. Those, those moved sanctions from just targeting Russian individuals to targeting certain parts of the financial sector. And that meant that ru many Russian right. firms and banks could no, no longer get foreign financing. But Russia's been living with this for four years now. Its economy actually is quite well placed to, tar to cope with some sanctions right. obviously there'll be some pain from this good to see you sir thank sir. you have a good weekend on a friday thank you for staying late for us tonight as we continue tonight elon musk inches closer to his 420 dollars target to take tesla private the sec is looking into the question of exactly how he's going to pay for it has he made a false statement about that i'll speak to their former chief of staff and the english premier league is back the world's richest football teams made a deal with rwanda to be their shirt sponsor, and we'll explain how that came about.